I asked Matt before, earlier, I said, what are you going to cover today? And he said, he's going to, I think he's going to, Matt, correct me, you're going to teach everyone that social media does not operate within a vacuum, right? How it's tied to so many other tools and resources. Is that correct? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so, good. Hey, I'm just going to um, and so what I did was I asked him if he could speak just five more minutes. That way we could walk away knowing everything. Okay. Uh, the reason we're here today is because social media and digital media is very complicated. It's changing all the time. So the reason we're, we're having this, oh, I just wanted to add one thing while we're doing this. There's a lot to learn. Okay. Some of us in this room are in this for a living, and it's overwhelming. Constantly changing, you have to keep up on so much stuff. And there's so much to do. So, this is a work in progress. Every time we meet, we're going to learn a little bit more. Hopefully, each month, you'll walk away feeling a little more confident, feeling like you have some greater abilities you had when you came in. So, uh, thank you all, all for being here. Uh, I was asked to introduce Matt and Angie, and uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about their background real fast. Uh, Angie. Basically, from I'm looking at her LinkedIn profile. Um, now, there is some neat stuff about you on your LinkedIn profile. I'm going to point out in a minute. Um, but it looks basically, it looks like Angie's been in the printing business for a very, very long time. It looked like she was in banking, doing it for banking. Is that correct? Integrity. What is integrity? Uh, not banking. Not banking. Okay. Or, okay. So basically, she was doing printing for about seven years, doing all kinds of fun stuff and doing it for other people. And so she finally decided, I'm sick of, uh, I'm sick of commuting from far away to Fishers. I think I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna do this work in my own backyard and help local, local friends and businesses do that. So, and a uh, little side note, she uh, graduated in 1997 from Alexandria Monroe High School. So she's actually very cool. Um, Matt, yours is interesting. Um, <laughs> you, you say that you're in uh, East, you're in uh, Muncie Young Professionals. I'm looking at your Muncie Young Professionals. Yeah, I'm looking at I'm looking at where you were born. I'm not sure. I I dropped out last year, but then they opened it up for you again this year. Okay, okay. So Matt is with Muncie Young Professionals, and Matt actually is responsible. Three years ago, uh, this group started in Muncie, and Matt was one of the founders of that group. So based on the success of that group, that group keeps growing and growing. People come from all over the place. That's where Tom Sire got the idea to start again. Um, Matt has been in the marketing world for uh, quite some time. He's worked for Spinweb, Fuseworks Studio, and Clickbook. Yeah. Okay. And he's been doing this for many, many, many years. And also, just so you know about Matt, he's also a DJ. So, if you're not impressed with what he has to share today, maybe he can come to do a wedding for you. He's a book, he's a DJ on the side. He's been doing it for 19 years. And one other thing about Matt I found interesting, Matt, uh, you were introduced as being said that, that you are a husband and wife team, but on your LinkedIn profile, it does indicate that your marital status is single. I'm still single. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what happened to do here this morning? But Matt, Matt and Angie are, um, on a serious note, Matt and Angie are experts in their field. They are highly respected by people who work with them. They're highly respected by people in their community. They are a perfect uh, first speaker uh, to kick this off. Uh, Matt is very, very well versed in everything, not just social media, but everything digital marketing. Uh, probably any question you ask them, he can answer. And uh, they're a great, wonderful team, as you saw in the uh, introduction on the, on the um, website, on Facebook, and everything, basically. Uh, they, they won awards. So they know what they're talking about, they know what they're doing, and uh, we're really honored and privileged to have them here this morning. So Matt and Angie, come on up. All right. Well, as Matt mentioned, uh, I, was, I was part of the group that uh, Tom put together. I'm going to stand up here. So um, uh, Tom asked me to be on the social media forum back in 2011. Uh, to sit on it and uh, answer questions and things like that with two or three other people. I love that because I don't like to do this um, in public speaking and get in front of people and all that. So, um, but I did it anyway, and from that, like a couple of months later, we started having these monthly meetings. And, uh, you know, people kept coming back to them and showing up, which was amazing to me. 
So uh, eventually I put together a committee uh, with Tom's help and uh, Peggy over there at the Small Business Development Center, and uh, we've made it work. And for the past five months, I think we've sold out um, the allotment we have for the room, which is about 65 people. Um, so we've been getting a, a constant 60 some people showing up every month uh, to learn about digital marketing or uh, social media. So uh, that's kind of the background on that. Uh, we are a farmhouse creative, of course, and I'm trying to use my phone here as a, uh, uh, a remote, and it looks like it works. So awesome. I'd like to introduce my wife, Angie Rogers Howe. Um, I, again, you just learned she's been in the printing business for seven to ten years. I think it's probably ten years. Um, uh, the uh, Carolyn Buffy Greaves back there, she uh, mentioned uh, her, her, when she introduced herself, she almost said printing creations, which um, she ran that company for 30, 30 plus years. And here just this, uh, this past June, June or July, we uh, first her, her book of business. She wanted to retire and go do some fun stuff and travel. So we took over that book of business from the print market. Which Angie takes sure. So as uh, Lee Byer, Tom, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Tom said, I'm, from, I'm a native from around here. I uh, grew up in Alexandria, went to school at Liberty Christian near Anderson for a while, and then I also graduated, went back to LA and I graduated there in '97. Um, I actually have a funny story about this library. Back in '97, we had to do our research paper as if one source from the internet, and it was brand new, nobody knew what it was. So our class, our, our uh, senior high school uh, English class took a field trip to this library and they sat us down and taught us what the internet was and how to use it and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it was funny, we all cited our source and it was like HTTP dot colon backslash backslash whatever whatever and it was like this long uh, for your sources. We didn't know what the internet was so uh, I always think that's funny that back here where, where I learned about the internet. How are we sounding back there? Can you hear us back there? I mean, I can be in this mic, but I don't okay. know. Okay. Back to the room. I got a thumbs up. <clears throat> well, this is me. As mentioned, I've worked for a, a few web design development companies over the years. Um, I started out uh, right out of high school in the uh, in radio. Uh, I loved radio. I was the overnight weekend guy on WNDH a few other radio stations. Uh, realized uh, after college that uh, I can't make any money in or I do at least. Uh, but I love to do it. So uh, I became a video editor uh, up in Portland. And from there, I uh, learned about the internet about 1997, 98. Um, started making the, uh, the website for the company I worked for. It was my first website I put together. Uh, and it was horrible, but it was, it was new and fresh back in those days. And then from there, I uh, spent about 10 years at SpinWeb, a couple of years at another local uh, web design firm. Um, before a farmhouse, before jumping on board that, I worked for an all virtual company, which was unique because I never met my boss face to face. We never actually shook hands or anything like that. It was all over go to meeting and uh, work from home, and it, it went through that whole thing, uh, which is an interesting thing when you go from uh, kind of a cubicle for eight hours to now you're at home, you can do whatever you want. So, um, but, but that allowed me to figure out what we wanted to do. Uh, she started her uh, farmhouse creative in November of 2012. Um, February of last year, 2014, I uh, took the leap of faith and jumped on board and been making websites and doing print marketing. So that's kind of our story in our back. Yeah, I can't hear you back here. Sure. All right. And as mentioned, uh, I'm a, well, we do it together. I'm a wedding DJ. I'm not your, uh, you know, cool uh, DJ. But, uh, not that, but we have fun. We, we do have fun. We do, do have our own system and everything. And, uh, and do that just kind of, kind of a hobby. Hobby, hobby job. And uh, they're doing it forever. But today, it's all about harvesting social media. That's a presentation title. Um, that I made up and gave it to Tom, and then I was like, oh, you got to make a presentation about that. So, for well, the past few weeks, I've been looking into that. <laughs> 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 oh, 
we thought it was fitting because we farmhouse creative. We really do live on a farm in farmland, and we operate the business primarily out of our home. And we also have an office at the innovation sector in Muncie. But like when you look out our window, there's farms and tractors, and we have chickens and all that good stuff. So farmhouse farming harvesting, we thought it all fit together very nicely. And uh, the social media gold part, or the gold part, is uh, like you mentioned. I, I'm from a farming family. And so every fall, when uh, when we harvest the beans and the corn, uh, my dad would say, "Ooh, you know, we're harvesting gold because that was money." Um, uh, you took his market and all that kind of stuff. So what we want to uh, present today, of course, is uh, using social media and harvesting the gold from that, um, and, and, and doing some things that we think you should know about. So we're going to do the uh, farm, uh, the farm cycle, planting, cultivating. Uh, harvesting and then uh, something at the end. So, first of all, is planting. So we want to plant starting to gather all of our stuff. So we want to make sure that our logo, we've got our logo, our brand, everything is communicated the same message. So, you want to, this is just some examples of our branding and our website and stuff and everything. So, everywhere you go, your logo is the same, your imaging is the same. It's all fitting the place where it's supposed to be, the pixels and the ratios and all that kind of stuff are where they're supposed to go. Exactly. You know, a lot of times people get their logo and they put it into social media or these digital outlets and it's skewed, it's pixelated, it just doesn't look good. So before you even get started doing anything, coming up with a strategy, campaign, whatever you got to do, just make sure your foundation's uh, correct. Make sure that logo looks as good as it can in Facebook and LinkedIn and uh, Twitter. Um, make sure your messaging and your imagery that you're using is consistent throughout all these uh, outlets. Now, this is for your company. If you're a personal brand, meaning uh, you know you're not really representing a, a company all the time, you've got your own thing. Do the same thing. Make sure your profile picture is the same throughout all your media. Uh, make sure your imagery is the same throughout all your media. So, uh, when somebody comes to you, they, they get this consistent look uh, and professional look and brand. One quick thing on that personal branding you note. Know, I don't know if you guys noticed I have like crazy bright red hair, which I love, and I use that picture. I mean, I have red hair because I like it, but it also makes me stand out a little bit. And I use that picture in my personal branding and on our website and things like that. And I have people come up to me. Yeah, there's me. Um, I have people come up to me and say, "You're the lady with the crazy red hair. Can you help me with my marketing or my my print?" Yes, I can. So it doesn't necessarily have to be that you have crazy red hair like me, but whatever you're, you're consistent with your image and your branding on a personal level and a business level will help you out. All right. Next up, uh, you know, after you get all your digital marketing outlets consistent uh, with your brand, uh, go back and look at your website. Your website's your probably your most important resource, or that's the way we feel. Your most important resource. Um, while you may have Facebook and you're very popular, or Instagram, you're, you're posting all the time, it's your website where you have your best chance to um, convert people into donors, clients, um, and, and members of your website. So, uh, first thing to look at when you're looking at your website, make sure it's up to date. This is actual, I thought this would be funny, uh, it's Apple's website from 1997. So if your website looks like that, you know you're old. You need to update. Um, so, yeah, OS 8, uh, even before OS 10. Yeah. But anyway, I thought that would be fun. But yeah, your website's looking like that. You're looking dated. You're looking a little old. Um, so, so look to update. And if your website isn't current, like you've got blog posts on there from like 2012, it kind of looks like you're not staying current. Or if you have an about us page, and five of those employees are no longer there, that kind of thing. We want to make sure all of that is updated before you go live and start pushing out all this content on your social media. So it looks like you've got all your ducks in a row with what you're doing. Uh, next up is mobile responsive. Back in the day when we first started uh, doing websites in general, you know, we only viewed them on our desktops, maybe our laptops, stuff like that. Uh, and if you wanted to do a uh, mobile responsive, you had to like build this whole custom thing and it cost thousands of dollars and all that kind of thing. It's not like that anymore. 
they're very easy to convert. So you want a website to make sure that it can be viewed on all of those, all of your devices. So your iPads, your phones, your tablets, all that good stuff. Make sure it stacks up right and nobody has to like scroll over and make the thing big and all that because people are not going to interact with your website and therefore with you if you don't have that online. We used to, like now, I think data shows Probably a third. A third of users are using it on mobile devices. So we really want to make sure we get to the mobile responsive websites and you're engaging with the audience where they're at. And actually, I think it's smaller or it's uh, easier for smaller businesses now to have a mobile uh, responsive website than larger organizations that have to spend all kinds of money to redesign their websites. Um, so as a small business owner uh, or, or a sm smaller organization that doesn't have to go through a lot of red tape, uh, this is very easy to do. Um, you just have to uh, talk to your vendors and your professionals and they'll help you out, of course, if you uh, don't have the tools to do it yourself. The other thing uh, uh, to look at from uh, the website perspective, as you're looking or planting our seeds to, to grow over time, um, look at the, uh, the, can it convert? What's the goal of conversion? So if they get to your website, what do you want them to do? Is it, is it uh, call you on the phone? Is it fill out a form? Is it download a piece of information that you're going to put out there, such as white paper or um, some brochure that, that you want everybody to see? So looking at the website from that conversion perspective uh, is really important at this stage because we're going to drive our social media back to that website because that's our best chance to convert them into clients and donors and things. So um, look at that. I uh, put out there a form stack it used to be uh, really hard to work with forms. Uh, you, have, you have to have special software and all kinds of stuff for your website. Uh, now, uh, if you're using WordPress, there's Contact Form 7, very easy form management system. But I use a form stack because it does a really good job at uh, collecting all the data and it's really easy to put on your website. Um, whether you just need a, you know, to collect their name and email address to get them to download that brochure, uh, or if you, uh, need a full-on job application or something like that. You can build it all online and uh, place it on your website. It's very easy. So just wanted to bring that up. And they're, they're kind of a local company. They're here in Indianapolis. So there's some other form management software packages out there. Just bring that one that, that we use. And we want to make sure we have a call to action. Like, what is it when people go to your website, Matt touched on it a minute ago, what do you want them to do? A lot of times we put up brochure websites and they look really great and wonderful. They tell what we do, they tell who we are, but it doesn't give anybody a clear way to interact with us. So whether it's, you know, click here to get more information or donate to our organization or become a member or we put up, uh, if you give us your information, we'll give you a brochure, 10 tips for this industry, that kind of thing creating valuable content that they get by giving you, giving us their information, then we can put it on our sales funnel and let all these back to sales. So making sure you know what the purpose of your website is and what you want them to do once they get there is key. Yep, and story time, we had clients who uh, who had a great blog post. It was 12 Steps to Mobile Development. And uh, his company is all about her. His business, uh, he's a uh, private vocal coach. So he was already giving his content out on a blog, and we noticed that he wasn't he wasn't getting contact information from people. People weren't contacting. Him. So what I did is we took that 12 steps to vocal development, made a PDF of it, uh, took it off the website unless you gave us your name and email address. And because of that, he's he's got quite a few contacts for that. He's landed at least five to five to ten new clients just because of that small little change. So looking at your website from that perspective. <coughs> What's the call to action? What do you want them to do? Definitely going to help get more people in your sales time. Content calendar. And you can spend all kinds of time just on a content calendar. But we recommend, even if you're only posting to social media, your blogs, your website, all that kind of stuff, once or twice a month, still put together a content calendar. There's all kinds of ways you can do it. You can use Google calendars. You can put it on your uh, day planner that you write on and all that kind of thing. You can put post-it notes on the wall. I've seen people do that. I don't recommend that because the post-its fall off and you can never find them. But 
create a content calendar that you know on Tuesday of this month I am posting this article or this is what I'm doing or I'm going to post to Facebook on this day and how I'm going to do it. It lets you keep track of what your cycle is because if you just wait, a lot of people are like, I'm just going to blog when I feel like it. And then it never happens because we get busy in our own businesses. I, I mean, we do this for a living and we have to like block out time to do it because otherwise we get busy doing the same old stuff that we do and it doesn't happen. So putting on a calendar, giving yourself deadlines, making sure you do it when you say you're going to do it, keeps you on track and keeps you focused. Excel spreadsheets, but where, what you're going to post, the dates and things like that, but it helps keep track and it helps you get a rhythm in social media that you're on. You're posting consistently, you're, you're giving out your message in a consistent manner, and it also lets you see the mix of what you're doing. If you're posting the same old stuff all the time and not mixing it up with different messages and things like that, probably missing out on a, a great opportunity to engage with your audience. The other one up here is uh, Hootsuite. Um, these two, Hootsuite and Buffer, are just some time-saving tools that we use. There's plenty more out there. There's a, there's a boatload of, of social media tools out there to uh, check out and learn. But Hootsuite's one of the most popular ones. It uh, allows you to schedule your posts uh, over time, um, and you can do anything and everything pretty much in it. So. Uh, you can put your channels in there, so you can post on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook all at the same time through that software. So it's a, it's a time-saving uh, software. Uh, and then Buffer, uh, all it is is allows you to, at least the free version, put uh, 10 articles in and schedule them out over time. So in one setting, I can find 10 articles that are relevant to my business and that I think my audience will find interesting, which is coming up. Um, schedule that over time so I don't have to think about it and do it every day and be in social media every day because I've got business for it. So. Now we're getting to the point of the strategy. What, what, uh, this is really where we're going to start to grow our social media growth. Um, and we've been working on it already, but the main deal is to have that website ready to go and have your social media outlets. Uh, in, in good condition. To drive all that social, uh, drive everything back to the website, um, if it makes sense to do so. So, what we mean there is when you're posting on Instagram and you're posting on Twitter, Facebook, whatever social media outlets that make sense for your business or organization, and you give back to the website. It's our best chance. It's our, almost our only chance to convert these people uh, into the sales funnel, into uh, your donor funnel, new members, whatever your goals are of your website, like why you're doing it in the first place, um, it's your best chance to do so. So let's get those people there. A lot of people, and I probably have that slide. Well, this slide is everything that you can get to your website. Your social media, lead tracking, blogging, uh, pay-per-click, all that kind of stuff. All needs to come back to your website. That's why the website is still the most important thing, right? It's the only place you get to tell your message, and Facebook's not going to change that. And Twitter's not going to change in six months to just change it up. Your website's your website. You have control over your message. Uh, we, th there's a saying out there, don't build on borrowed land. And that's what Facebook is. If you build and put all your uh, efforts into Facebook, and never get back to your website, never tell your story, you're building on borrowed land, and Facebook likes to change that land up. Uh, and a lot of times that hurts you, um, right? Over the past six months, we've seen Facebook uh, posting for Facebook for fan pages. They post to a fan page. They squash that down to only two to four percent of your audience will actually see that, unless you do some things that we're going to tell you uh, to raise that up. But really, you're posting to nobody right now, unless you're going to pay for it and do our tip that we're going to give you. Uh, so. Um, again, you point get everything to your website and stop wasting that social media juice. Um, get it back to your website. That's that's probably our, our if I can get you to do anything today, that's why we do it. Um, figure out ways to get people back to the website and convert them into your either sales cycle or uh, whatever your goals are for your website. So again the <laughs> so we want to store our web 
website, who want to share a post on social media, and then notify your advocates. We'll talk about all three of these really quick. But we, I recommend utilizing your content in various avenues. So just we create a blog post, and then we all, we share that on our website. Then we share that on our Facebook. Maybe we, we tweak it a little bit so it works on Facebook. We tweak it a little bit so it goes on Twitter. Uh, we put it in our email newsletter. So just because you have to create content for all these different avenues doesn't necessarily mean you have to create 15 different things that are going to all these different places. Now, we want to change them up so it doesn't look like we're just hitting the same markets with every the same thing everywhere, but we can repurpose that content. So we want to post it on our website. We want to share it on social media. And if you don't know how to post, you want to make sure we know how to do that, too, in your in your website blog, blogging capabilities. Yeah, you hope, well, um, you know, work with your website vendor or whatever, so you've got good content management <coughs> and you know how to post and then how to share it in social media. Again, once it's shared in social media from your website, they come back to your website to see the blog post. So don't just put it in social media and not leave it back to your website. Just, just do that and you'll, you'll get to capture data, uh, information, how many people are coming, where they're coming from, all that sort of thing at the end of our presentation about measuring your analytics. So, um, next up, uh, be sure to share content, not just yours. So, now we get into the community aspect. So, you're posting information, but um, it's all about this mix of you're sharing information, you should be sharing other people's information as well that they're posting. Be a good neighbor, because the more you share, the more you comment, the more you uh, do stuff on social media with other people's posts, they're going to likely reciprocate and do it for you too. Um, so be sure to share content and share valuable content with um, your, your social media followers. So if there's something new and interesting in your arena, be sure to share that with your um, with, with all your followers and allow them to share the content have this conversation out there. You want to be interesting. Um, a lot of people will drone on on social media, on and on and on, and nobody cares. So we want to put things out there that are interesting, that we care about, that our users, our clients, our members will care about. Um, it doesn't always have to be about me, 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 this is my company, this is what we do. Um, it can be interesting things about, about the community or about what's going on in your organization and things like that. So mix it up a little bit so you, it's not always the, it's not always the Matt and Angie Farmhouse show. We talk about other stuff that's going on and everything too. But be interesting. Don't just be the boring person who posts big long things that are long and nobody reads. And I'm sure we'll get questions at the end about uh, that line between you know, having a professional look and feel and then your uh, your personal life and things like that. From the interesting perspective, we have a uh, what is she? Just a 15 months old uh, baby. Um, and we've been posting, she posted a, a photo per day on Instagram uh, for the first year. So we have all these photos of the baby and everybody wants it and all that kind of stuff. And that became part of our mix. Uh, while she was posting that, she was also posting information um, that was relevant to our client base uh, about marketing services, social media, and things like that. Um, so just mix it up, be interesting as, as well as you can. Um, and that includes like memes, this thing. Uh, I just Googled that and found it and, and threw it in the slideshow. Uh, you see these all the time, a, a photo with text on it, and usually they're funny. Um, throwing that into the mix, along with that blog post that leads back to the website, you're just looking interesting, you're keeping uh, top of mind, and just allows you to post for, you know, multiple times per day that way. Um, the other thing to do, uh, in your post, ask questions. One of the number one ways to, to get comments back to your post. So um, ask a question out there, uh, and hopefully by now you've seen this a lot. You know what's uh, what's your favorite food to eat on Friday night? Things like that could be could be crazy. Could be something to do with your industry, but it allows for some engagement to happen. Um, and then comment. Respond to comment. Sorry, I didn't realize you said so good. Okay. Respond to comment. Um, both on your personal or your business site and other people's sites. So if you are friends with a community organization and they are interacting with things that are important to you, 
interact over there, go talk to them, leave comments, respond to comments, have a dialogue going on. And again, on your site, your, your Facebook or wherever you're at, respond to those comments. If people are hopefully answering the questions that you're asking and you're putting out there, then respond as well, like my favorite food on Friday night is pizza or whatever. Uh, so kind of keep that dialogue going to show that you're a personable brand or an organization or whatever you are. Also, don't be afraid this is what a lot of people get tripped up. They're like, I don't want to post comments because people are going to be mean to me on the internet. And yeah, sometimes people are mean on the internet because you are, you know, they're anonymous. They can just say whatever they want. So don't be afraid to respond to criticism that you get on your blog posts or your comments on Facebook or whatever. Um, it gives you a good opportunity to be like, hey, I hear what you're saying. Maybe it's a valid point. Here's what we're doing to correct it. Or you're I think you're totally off base, but we can agree to disagree. And then if you get somebody who's really, really just being a troll, and because some people, I think they just exist to just mess with people on the internet, you can always delete posts or block people and things like that. I mean, obviously, we don't want to do that with every little infraction, but if someone's being just a giant jerk, feel free to delete them, because guess what? It's my page. I own it. I get to say what happens there. And if I don't want them on there, then they won't be there. But don't be afraid to respond to your critics and people who are maybe giving you constructive criticism, criticism, criticism and things like that. Yeah. And usually the jerks, uh, everybody else knows they're a jerk too. They don't have to be first place. Here's a couple of graphics I found interesting. And again, it's all about posting and, and being interesting. If you look at uh, the photo up there, photo for Twitter and photo for uh, uh, Facebook, the percentage is very high. That gets the most views, that gets the most eyeballs. And we're, the, the other thing I thought was really interesting was video, how low it was. Because I thought it would be much, much higher. Because uh, moving pictures, I thought would draw you in, things like that. But it was actually down more than that photo. So be thinking of that when you're, when you're looking to be interesting. You don't have to be a great photographer. Uh, you just have to capture the moment and get it posted up there. Um, and again, by doing so, you look interesting, so when you do post that blog post that's uh, maybe a recap of the event that you were at, you draw those people back over to your website where you can, where you can hopefully convert them. I'll say one quick thing about pictures. Uh, my pet peeve is when people, I, I, my saying is, just because you take a picture doesn't necessarily mean that you have to post it. Uh, if it's blurry or out of focus or someone is making like a crazy face in the background or something, you don't have to post it. They don't have to be professional level shots, but make sure it's conveying the image and the, 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 the message that you're trying to convey. So uh, don't be shy to post the pictures, but make sure they don't look terrible when you do. Um, and also video, we see that it's down lower. I think because it's newer and people are still getting used to it, um, make sure when you do post videos, if you're going to do it, again, it doesn't have to be like fancy schmancy or whatever, but we want it to be engaging and entertaining. People are going to look at them more if it's not just me standing in front of a microphone, reading from a script, and it's boring, boring, boring. No one's going to listen to that. Whereas if we've got some interaction going on, and maybe it's funny, or we're telling a story, or whatever, those things are going to get more interaction and more engagement than just a big long, here's what we do, and here's why we're here, and those kinds of things. Yeah, and keep it short. I mean, short and sweet, that's, that's pretty much the... Uh, uh, what, what they were saying to do with video. If it's really engaging and it's for an audience, I mean, the longer it, it could work. But for the most part, keep it short. And we all have the attention spans of squirrels on Facebook now. You look, and now they've got video that just starts while, while, you, while you look at them, which I think is great. Um, because I can quickly tell, I don't want to see that. Um, uh, what was I going to say? The other thing, um, you know, look how high links are, uh, sharing of links text. Um, so again, people want information. If you have uh, articles out there that you found from other blogs or other industry sources, your audience probably thinks that's interesting too. So share that uh, out there on social media so they, they can share it with that. And reciprocation. So. Email marketing. Yay. Uh, here's, here's something that I don't think is being used very well uh, or at all. Uh, probably in most of small businesses and organizations um, because it's a, it's a little bit harder to do. It's kind of like blogging. 
it's hard to do, so we don't we don't end up doing it. Social media really is kind of easy. I mean, take picture, post it, uh, everybody sees it, and there's engagement. Um, email marketing is something that's uh, that's a little different. Uh, you actually have to make up the email. <laughs> so there's some rules that, that we looked up real quick in this infographic um, when you're putting together your email marketing campaign. But why you're doing it is you're actually talking to the people you already know. You've got them on they're, they're your clients, they're your, uh, your donors, uh, the people that already you know are connected to you. Um, there are people you got from social media over to your website and they signed up for that newsletter. So now, what we need to do is well, now we have permission to talk to them because they've bought into our, given us their email, they're already our client, they make a compelling subject. I see a lot of people who send out like Farmhouse Creative uh, newsletter, volume one. Most people are going to go click, we're not going to look at that because I have a million emails in my inbox and if it doesn't catch, if it's not catchy, or at least looks like it could provide valuable information, I'm not going to look at it. So we're make sure to do that. Make it personal. If you have the ability to capture their, their your client's name or their organization, you can integrate that in with your social media. So it's like, good morning, Angie. Or your email, I'm sorry. Good morning, Angie. Blah, 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 blah. So make it personal as much as you can. And keep it to the point. Uh, Matt mentioned we all have attention spans of squirrels lately. So we don't want to have this huge, long email campaign. We want to keep it to the point. Uh, so people get the bullet points. Uh, you don't have to put every single event you're having in the entire calendar year in your one email newsletter. Uh, keep it consistent and concise with maybe the three that are coming up or what's happening this summer or whatever your focus is. Keep it to the point so people actually read it and pay attention to what's going And then one message. We don't want to have to have 50 million different things going on. What is the target of what we're doing? maybe this quarter or this month or whatever. So take one message and go from there. Now, and make sure it has some kind of value to the people you are talking to. Um, and then have that call to action. Again, get them back to the website to do something. Whether it's to contact you, uh, give give more money if, if you're after donations. Um, just just always look for that, those call to action opportunities. You, uh, it, it, it's funny, but we have to lead people to the water. Lead a horse to water. You have to lead people where we want them to go. So give them a call to action so they can get there quicker. Go ahead, traditional, traditional marketing. I'm the resident print geek at our house. I I go to out in public and I feel like the paper of the, the menus, and restaurants, and things like that. So uh, I think traditional marketing also works. So yes, social marketing, social media is great. Email marketing is great. But also put it in your traditional marketing. So if you are doing a billboard outside. Right? How many of you have seen billboards that just have like their name and a phone number? People are never going to remember that phone number. It's hard. It's hard we're going because we're going on the highway, you're not going to remember the phone number. If you put your website on there, big and bold, they're going to be able to find you better. So same thing with all your traditional print marketing. You put your website on there, get people going to it and everything. Um, and on your, all of that, just direct them to the website, the best place where you can have to to get their information, to get their content, um, and all of that. And of course, uh, radio's big in this area, not not so much TV, it's down the indie market, but you've got podcasts and, and, and uh, cable advertising. Just be sure to use your, you know, direct them to the website or direct them to a page on the website that uh, that you want to get them to. Uh, radio, for, for instance, I mean, we hear numbers all the time, and I don't know about you guys, I don't remember numbers anymore. If they're not in the phone or Somebody doesn't call me like oh, you called me, or texted me today. Say, hey, are you up? I'm like, who is that? It's not in my contact. We don't remember phone numbers anymore. So um, because we have these smartphones and they take care of it for us. But websites, I can remember a, a, a short URL or something like that, SmithBodyWorks.com or something like that. Um, but use that in your radio advertising, your uh, uh, PR press releases, which is great fodder for blog uh, posts. Um, if, you're not, if you're into the, the press release industry where you have to write a nice press release for uh, the launch of a new product or, or service, um, you know, use that in your blog as well. But the PR should always lead back to the website. Find more information at xyzcompany.com. All right, Paul, oh, I got to talk about that. So events are different to me. Um, 
they're, they're the one thing that I don't always lead back to a website. Because events like this event today, um, I know for the social media group, we use Eventbrite. So to RSVP for our event, you go to the Eventbrite website where I created the, uh, uh, the event for you to sign up. So, in, so it's a little different of driving people to wherever they need to sign up or do the action so they can come to your event. Uh, so that's why I kind of pull it out as different. I don't uh, want to send them to the website because the website usually has different goals and different places to go. Uh, so they may get lost and not get to my event RSVP or buy tickets or uh, do things like that. And also events just like this one. Uh, I forgot to, we, we kind of came up with a hashtag for Twitter, which was uh, all Anderson Digital Media Circle, ADMC. So hashtag ADMC. <laughs> um, we do this as a, again, the social media group that, that we help with. It's uh, hashtag ECI SMG and at the end of it, uh, I'm up here, uh, at the end of the uh, the event or whatever, we check out everybody's posts, what they've been posting, uh, what they thought was valuable, what they didn't think was valuable, and take that into consideration when we're planning the next event. Uh, so the, the presenter could have been horrible and, and uh, wasn't engaging at all. We'll know that from, from everybody's hashtag. Another thing we do at the end of it is this new tool called Storify. You can create all, take your hashtag, and you can pick all of the tweets and the Facebook posts, everything that you like, and you can create a Storify so people can see instead of having to go search out on Facebook and Twitter and all over the place. You can put that together, put it on your website, and kind of recap the day of your event. Uh, we just did it last month for our social media group. It turned out pretty cool at the end. Uh, so people can kind of scroll through, see the real-time version of what was happening, but like after the fact. So it's a pretty cool recap. You can do the videos and the tweets and the pictures that were posted and all that in a pretty neat format to kind of consolidate it all into one one post. Yeah, and then uh, one final thing before we, we move on to the harvesting part um, is this idea of recap. Um, we are at an event. We take photos here and all that, that sort of thing. Um, and you probably do it for your organization and, and, and your businesses. You're engaging in social media all the time. You're posting. It's great, but it's not always leading back to your website. One way to do that is the next day or after the event, do a recap, uh, blog post of what went on, who bought when, where, who showed up, that sort of thing. Put a few pictures in it, and then share it in social media to lead people back to your website. Um, just a great great way to use the content that you're already posting anyway in a way that's going to benefit you in the future. All right, harvesting. So now we're going to harvest. So hopefully, if we've done everything that we said we're going to do, we've got the foundation, we've got our brand, we've got our logo, we have our website, we're posting all of, all of our social media, and we're being engaged. The goal of all of that is to increase sales and have a full sales funnel. So you should see results coming in to your to your website, hits to your website, email submissions to to you to get more information and all that. So it will lead to fuller sales funnel, which hopefully will make you more money, give you more clients, get more donations, get more members, whatever your goal is for your organization. Yeah, and same thing for members and donations for nonprofit organizations. Doing all the stuff should equal something and it should be an increase in uh, Sales, members, donations, whatever your measurement goals are, uh, you should see an increase in that. If you don't, well, it's time to relook at things and say what what went wrong, what went right, um, and all that. The best way to do that is analysis. So we get down to uh, the numbers. So what do we use to measure our social media and our website um, analytics? And we, of course, we there's a bunch of tools out there, but. Here are some of the tools we've uh, used in the past. Google Analytics for your website. Tells you uh, how many people are coming to the website, what they're looking at, where they're coming from. It's just a little, a few little clicks get you all kinds of information. It's overwhelming at first, but just Googling how to read Google Analytics, you're gonna find out uh, what those numbers mean and what they can mean to you over time. Um, Facebook Insights, another, another thing that is daunting when you look at it. It's like, why are all these numbers? And things. But just spend a little bit of time and doing a little, little bit of research, 
tells you uh, if all those uh, Facebook posts that you've been doing are effective or if you're just nothing's happening. So you want to look and see, like maybe your video posts are like going crazy and everybody's everybody's interacting with those. So great, then we want to re we want to keep doing those more. Maybe nobody is paying attention to the Twitter posts that we're there, that we're tweeting. So we're going to take a look and reevaluate what what our strategies are because everybody wants the the social media silver bullet. And unfortunately, there's not like if you do X Y Z, do this right now, then boom, it's going to work and you're going to be on fire. Sometimes it's not like that. Um, different industries are reaching different people. Different uh, segments of the population respond differently. Matt and I, we did uh, we did three posts for Farmhouse Creative, all essentially telling the same information, but one had different. They all had different pictures and a little bit different wording. We found that one of those posts got way more, like 50% more interaction than the other two did. And so then we back up and we're like, oh, I thought those two were going to be great, but obviously they weren't. So we tweak them and then go from there. So it's all about trial and error and learning your, who your audience is and what they interact with and what they respond to. Okay. At the social media group, we had a whole uh, session on analytics itself. Like, uh, so you can go very deep into these things. A couple other tools that uh, you may not know about. Twitter actually has analytics where you can see per, uh, per tweet uh, the interaction and what it did out there. The other thing I just found out, uh, just because I was looking because of this presentation, I uh, didn't realize that LinkedIn has uh, analytics for their company pages. So if you have a company page in LinkedIn, which I definitely recommend anybody in the B2B business to business arena, uh, get your company page. I think LinkedIn is going to be still huge uh, over the next two to two, three years um, for business to business interaction. Business to consumer, um, I still see Facebook and Twitter being, being the arenas to be in. Um, but LinkedIn is gaining a lot, a lot more steam. Uh, but yeah, again, there's numbers. Uh, if, if you take your blog post, put it in LinkedIn, you can see some of the interaction and get some numbers for that. All right, now we to winter. Now, I did not grow up on a farm like Matt did. So I tended to think that, hey, in wintertime, farmers, they just take the winter off, and they just kind of sit back and relax and just wait until spring. Obviously, I've been schooled in the art of farming since now I live in farmland. Uh, that's not what happens. Farmers are out there working on their tractors. They're planting their seeds, buying their seed for next year, all that good stuff. So that's what we need to do in our winter, too. Uh, now, this doesn't necessarily have to be a whole year-long campaign. Maybe we're only doing a month campaign for what for our summer enrollment or whatever we're gonna do. So we'll do those three steps already, the planting, cultivating, harvesting, and now we need to take a step back, look at our analytics, what worked, what didn't work, uh, get excited about what our new thing is gonna be, because we can't just, oh man, that one campaign was great. Okay, now, now what are we gonna do? It's always about the next thing, how are we gonna keep people engaged? So we need to get re-energized, put that plan into place, what are we gonna talk about for this next campaign, how long is it gonna last, what are we going to focus on? And then strategize that. Put those in place so then you're ready to start the whole process over again from the beginning. You've got it all planned out and it's not like reinventing the wheel at that point. Exactly. And it shouldn't take you, uh, you know, the planting stage should be that much shorter because you've already got your uh, your logos and, and your messaging just right from the, from the last campaign. So look at those, uh, but, but go through them anyway, you know. Do we have the foundation we want for our new message or our new campaign, the plan and the strategy that we want to implement? Um, the, the cultivation, you know, what did we learn last time that we could use this time? Maybe Instagram was huge for you um, and, and it was surprising. So now you can use that in your, uh, in your next campaign, your next uh, segment. And then, uh, of course, harvesting, just being sure to measure what happens and uh, use it to plan out the next, uh, next big campaign. But with that, I think we're done.